Welcome to the Five Phenomenon Podcast. I am your host, Shane Hazen, and with me in the revolving guest host roster, a new guest host, Lonnie Gonzalez. Hi, Shane. Thanks for having me. (laughs) Yeah. Lonnie and I uh, work together at the Austin Film Society, and uh, what's the website you write for currently? Well, you know, I have the my blog, which is Cinema Then and Now, Um, but uh, my husband also blogs there. Uh, he does more writing there. I've also been writing for a site called Book and Film Globe. Okay. So, um, yeah, you can find some things from me on there lately. One of my favorite stories of yours that I know you've told a thousand times <laughs> is you were a guest host on Turner Classic Movies. I was. It was uh, <laughs> the Shock! excitement of my life. <laughs> You want to talk about it? Sure. No, yeah. Um, So uh, back when the TCM had their 15th anniversary, which would have been in 2009 is when um, it all aired, uh, they invited 15 people to be fan guest programmers. And um, actually, there wasn't a contest or anything. I had actually entered a previous contest to be a (laughs) fan programmer. And because of some mix up with not getting, you know, my paperwork sent in and notarized in time. I actually couldn't be a finalist in that competition, but they were very kind enough to invite me um, again when there was another opportunity. So I was Do they just drop the envelope inside the other container? (laughs) Just move it on to the next one? Yeah, well, you know, they were just, uh, I think it was all invite only. And since I had entered that previous contest, they had already seen me kind of talk on camera and say how much I love Turner Classic Movies and I love classic movies and so they invited me to be one of the 15 and uh, so I got to go to Atlanta and I got to film with Robert Osborne which was a real you know treat and honor he's a wonderful the late, man the yes, late, the Robert, late Osborne. Robert Osborne but uh, I think all classic film fans certainly Turner Classic Movie watchers have a soft spot for him um, and I got to film an intro with him for the movie Grand Illusion. Really? Grand Illusion? What would you have to say about that? Um, well, I picked it. Like, I, we all got to sort of submit 10 films that we, you know, kind of a top 10 that we could talk about it. And I picked Grand Illusion because it is one of my favorite films. Um, you know, it's a French movie. It's a anti-war movie from about World War One, And I just think it's a beautiful movie. And... Uh, it was actually the first time that that movie had ever played on the channel. You're so kidding. They, you know, yeah. So um, I think they liked that I had suggested it because it gave them the opportunity to actually um, go through the uh, process of getting it for the channel. Because, you know, they have certain movies in their catalog and then sometimes they get things sure. that are kind of outside the um, Time Warner catalog. I remember proudly in high school um, <laughs> when we had film class senior year, Uh, We watched Casablanca, and um, the part where everyone sang um, the thing, I was like, I stood up and I was like, this is just a rip off of Grand Illusion. (laughs) I mean, it's definitely inspired. (laughs) Inspired. uh, As a teenager, I was just looking for who did it first, and you can only, that's how originality works. It's never repeated. (laughs) Yeah, no, it's amazing, actually, if you do have a chance to watch that movie, then you'll see so many things, um, you know, that uh, in later classics like Casablanca that were really uh, inspired, we'll say, (laughs) by Great Illusion. Plus, it's just such a great, it's just got such a great wisdom to it. It's just such a uh, humanist movie. It's one of those, it's one of those, like, founding movies that doesn't judge its characters, especially in a very volatile situation. Yeah, I mean, mean, it's showing people on both sides of the war and bringing humanity to both sides. Um, Yeah, that's why it's, I mean, it's not only um, beautiful to look at, but has a beautiful heart to it, too. I guess, are you a Renoir fan fan in in general? Uh, Yeah, I mean, I haven't seen all his films that that he 
I don't think he made that many, but um, I've seen Rules of the Game and I liked it, but um, I prefer Grand Illusion. And um, I've also seen a movie that he made in India um, called The River, I believe, which is That's actually a really That's a Scorsese favorite, isn't it? Um, maybe. Uh, I know it was, I, I think that might be one of the ones that his uh, foundation recently kind of restored. That sounds um, right. Which is a, it's a beautiful, it's in color, which uh, his other, the other two were in black and white. And so uh, that's, a, yeah, that's also a very beautiful movie. Yeah, Grand Illusion was a big Orson Welles influence too. It was like Stagecoach and that were like the two movies he would take to his grave or something like that. Around the time he was making Citizen, <laughs> Ga- Citizen Kane. Yeah. Um, so for this new format, we're, we're, we're doing two weeks each and we're trading picks and, and we're allowing a broad version of it. And you decided, do you want to go ahead and introduce the, your pick? Well, you know, you said that you would maybe like to talk about a classic movie since that, like, I've just been talking about how much I, you know, love uh, classic movies. And so I picked one of my favorite actresses from that era, uh, the 40s, is Teresa Wright, who, um, you know, a lot of people will have seen in The Best Years of Our Lives. Hopefully you've seen these movies. If you if you haven't, you should check them out. Uh, Shadow of a Doubt, the Hitchcock movie she's the star of are probably her two best known roles, but she's actually, she had quite a good run at the beginning of her career, which we can talk about later. And then I also recommended to you uh, a film from 1952 called The Steel Trap. That was the one I just watched last night and I have, (laughs) uh, we don't have the available visual, but I have a page full of notes on it. (laughs) Good. Uh, I I was very intrigued by this pick. (laughs) Why did you pick this one? Just because... Well, well, I knew that you had seen, I, you know, I didn't really know how you wanted to do the conversation, but I knew you had seen some of her other movies and you, I, you, you know, know I, I can definitely talk about those, but I thought this steel trap is kind of a smaller movie that I don't think a lot of people have seen. It's no. plays on, plays on TCM. That's where I saw it, but, um, okay. it's, but, uh, it is streaming and it's on DVD or you can rent it on streaming and it's on yeah, DVD. Yeah. I watched it on prime. Or it's not so, on Prime, I watched it on Amazon. But So what was your first viewing like on TCM? So, yeah, so I'll just say a little bit about the movie. It is kind of a, it's a suspense movie. It's kind of a bank caper uh, about a, a man who works at a bank who decides almost on a whim to steal the money from his, the big safe and then tries to make an escape and bring his wife along. And the man is played by Joseph Cotton. The, his wife is played by Teresa Wright. And then you're watching them kind of every step of the way through uh, them trying to get out of town. And, uh, you know, at first she doesn't know. And um, then kind of, you know, I was like, the first time I watched it, I was kind of on the edge of my seat the whole time because it, it is a get... very tense movie. It's very, very tense. tense. <laughs> because, you know, uh, like I said, it's almost, it's not really clear how much he's actually planned this out too much. And so almost immediately, <laughs> everything kind of goes a little bit wrong from, you know, how his, you know, your smooth ideal uh, you know, plan would go. And so everything starts to go wrong. And so the whole time you're just kind of like pulling on your hair, biting your nails, thinking, are, is he going to pull this off? Is, okay. Are they going to get through this? Are they going to get through this? And so um, the first time I saw it, and then after I saw it, I thought, wow, that's a fun suspense movie that I've never seen before. And uh, it was interesting watching it again for this um, to see that obviously I know what happens, but so I'm kind of, th- you know, you get to kind of sit back a little bit, relax a little bit, because you know how things are going to turn out. But there was still that, like, oh, God, what is, oh, no, like, it, but it's almost five o'clock. Are they going to get to the office? You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. All right. So as we mentioned, or you and I talked about before we started recording, I got, um, uh, there's a book about Teresa Wright that just came out four years ago. And mm-hmm. I got it from our great Evansville <laughs> Vandenberg Public Library, five star library. And but I was only able to skim through it really fast. Um, but Teresa Wright was actually pretty dismissive of this movie. <laughs> she um, yeah. she had a, so she has this weird uh, story where 
I, I guess I don't know if we want to go into it now or later, but basically the first three movies she was in, she was nominated for an Oscar. Yeah, and I believe she's the only person that has ever kind of achieved that uh, claim to fame. As her very first three movies, uh, she got a uh, where The Little Foxes, where she was nominated for Best Supporting Actress, and then Mrs. Miniver, which was another supporting actress nominated. That's and the only of, one of these I've seen. And Pride of the Yankees, uh, she got nominated for Best Actress. And actually, Mrs. Miniver and Pride of the Yankees were uh, eligible in the same year. So mm. in one year, she was nominated in both categories. And two of those are William Wyler movies, well, as, lo- as is Best of Our li- Best Years of Our Lives. Yes, yeah, and he, I think, um, yeah, he, you know, she was an actress that he enjoyed working okay. with. Okay. Um, but yeah, sure, like so, those are her first three movies out of the gate, and then she makes after part of the Yankees, Shadow of a Doubt. In 1943, and, and Hitchcock, Hitchcock like a her Hitchcock too. movie, yeah, and Hitchcock liked her too, and although they didn't work together again, but then uh, and then Best Years of Our Lives is just a, a couple years after that, and I mean that's like this amazing run of just like really great movies right, uh, right out the gate. I don't know that that's possible anymore these days, because um, back then with the studio system, you know, you were getting kind of these hand picked projects. <laughs> Well, the other crazy thing was, I don't remember when she started, but um, with her contract with Samuel Goldwyn, but she was under <laughs> contract with him. I want to say it was before Shadow of a Doubt. I know, like, it was, I say, yeah, it was when she first, her first movie. So Okay, you know, okay, so she was all the way through the 40s. Well, yeah. the crazy thing, some of this is on Wikipedia, some of this is in the book. Basically, at the end of the 40s, either her first or second child, she was getting sick with the child and she didn't want to do publicity Mm -hmm. and i guess she ran afoul of goldwyn at some point already but when she she did actually did some publicity but she didn't do the full amount and goldwyn just threw the gauntlet down and fired her uh, without just right away and Mm -hmm. what was fascinating i didn't realize and putting two and two together is you hear a lot of studio contract um for actors and actresses in the 40s and they almost all seemed to end around 48. And the book points out that that was when the Paramount uh, decree came, came along. And there was suddenly a fear that actors weren't going to have consistent as much work. So these contracts died out. And then you have a few years later, Jimmy Stewart has his contract with Harvey where he gets profit participation. And it changes the way actors are paid for movies pretty thoroughly. Hmm. Yeah, and I think that was kind of also in that era was when Olivia de Havilland had her lawsuit against uh, Warner Brothers, which also changed the fact that um, they couldn't kind of lock people into contracts for um, as long amount of time. That was like a California state law thing, wasn't it? Um, I mean, I'm not a legal expert. I don't, <laughs> I don't know all the details, but it was a. Uh, it was. I just. So, re- like, I remember it was fascinating because yeah. it was like a labor law thing. They yeah, pointed yeah, out exactly. that like it was a labor ca- law thing. California labor law for everyone else could only go five years, but these studio contracts were seven years and things like that. Yeah, and they would uh, if you weren't working, they would kind of like put pause on the contract, and then so they could kind of string you along for much longer than even the period in the contract. So, yeah, the studio contracts weren't so great. Well, the thing that Teresa Wright seemed to be more objecting to, she was doing, she came from New York and doing uh, stage work in New York. And I guess she was inconsistently doing it. She was an early participant in the, the La Jolla Playhouse. Oh, well, you know, I actually worked there when I lived in San Diego. So Really? Uh, really, yes, Lonnie? I didn't connection. know that. <laughs> Well, they had this list on there of some early actors who were there and they would do this the summer around 49 or 50 like they would do like a play a week with like a week of rehearsal and they had Olivia de Havilland, Charlton Heston. I mean, it was a really cool list of people they were having early on when they first formed. And Yeah, I know um, uh, Gregory Peck was one of the yeah. uh, founders and Dorothy McGuire, I believe, someone else I can't remember, but yeah, so a lot of these like big Hollywood people. Around the time she was getting fired, she was doing this, and she was. Go- I want to say she was going back to New York. She maybe started doing her first TV jobs, but um, she objected to the publicity part of it. And I get mm-hmm. I, I, reading through the all the extra like keep your weight at a certain things, all these extra mm-hmm. little 
you know, I don't know if there was, I doubt there was a morals clause with her because her whole thing was that she was always above board, but. Well, one of the interesting things about her contract was, um, you know, she did have a stipulation that she would be able to go back and do uh, work on the stage at least once a year. But the one thing that was really unique was um, she had a clause in there that said that she wouldn't do those sort of cheesy photo shoots <laughs> that a lot of the contract stars had to do. And so that exact text that I've seen a few places, just to give you an example, it kind of lists a bunch of different scenarios, but it says like, Teresa Wright shall not be required to pose for photographs in a bathing suit unless she is in the water. <laughs> uh, nor may she pose in any of the following situations, in shorts, playing with a cocker spaniel, digging in a garden, whipping up a meal, looking insinuatingly at a turkey for Thanksgiving. <laughs> so there's just all these very you, specific things. You know those things. turkeys, they, they, just, they seem <laughs> too provocative. You know, twinkling on prop snow in a skiing outfit while a fan blows her scarf. So she like had, you know, right away was saying like, I'm not going to do this, you know, these cheesecake photos. Uh, don't make me pose in bunny ears for an Easter photograph that has nothing to do with a movie. And I mean, you know, if you look through like the archives or whatever from the studios, there are these kind of random photos of, you know, the starlets of the time just kind of posing that they would give away as, you know, publicity photos. And she just wasn't having it. Well, what's funny to me is getting back to the movie is, and I watched Best Years of Our Lives, rewatched it in prep. I watched a little bit of Pride of the Yankees, and all these movies were movies. It's from the 40s. I, you expect that. I, I'm trying not to look at it at a modern lens. And it's also, <laughs> especially with Best Years of Our Lives, the whole movie is about the men coming back to a country that had lost the majority of its men. So it's going to be a man-based movie. But yeah. all three of these roles are just her, like, hanging around guys being like, are you okay? Because <laughs> yeah. even her comment on Steel Trap, her very dismissive comment of it was that she spent the entire movie counting how much money Joseph Cotton had spent the entire movie <laughs> and occasionally saying, you spent $30? You spent $50? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, I think that maybe the roles, yeah, they're not as uh, well written as they could have been, let's say. But I think that she, as an actress, has uh, is bringing, you know, interesting things to those roles, even when they are, you know. I mean, I I do like her role in Best Years of Our Lives. I think that is That's an a, interesting I... one. I didn't mean um, to be dismissive of that yeah, one as yeah. much, but yeah, but yeah, I mean, I think for a lot of actresses at the time in the '40s, a lot of it is like, well, you're the wife or you're the girlfriend, and it's like reacting to whatever your your man is doing. <laughs> and times have changed. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess I wanted to ask you a little more in depth about what particularly rights appeal to you was as an actress okay so i think i first saw Teresa wright maybe in shadow of a doubt maybe it was best years of our lives maybe even the little foxes but one of those early movies and i think i responded right away to the fact that she just seemed kind of unique uh for actresses at the time and that she just seemed very genuine and had that sort of appeal of a real person and even though you know the writing of movies isn't necessarily, well, these aren't like the things that a real person would say, or, you know, I think she feels like a person who you would be the girl next door. She does have mm -hmm. that very um, sort of unaffected kind of uh, presence on screen. And that's something that people, you know, said at the time. It's something that people have said about her since then that, uh, she just felt like a, a person kind of off the street who, you know, was really going through these situations. Mm. And sometime, and, you know, at that time, especially at, you know, studios like MGM, they were very in, much into the glamour 
of movie stars and uh, the actresses had to be very made up and looking glamorous and taking those publicity shots with the you know, on skis and uh, that just wasn't her image and uh i and she saw that seems kind of uh yeah I, I just found it very appealing i saw uh, i reread um her what little mentions there was there of her in mark harris's five came back the book about mm. um the five directors that went over to World War II, including William Wyler. And they pointed out that, you know, Wyler, when he ca- and he came back from the war, he was, you know, not interested in doing anything. He, like, he, he was a more realist-based filmmaker after he came back. And one of the things he did with um, Teresa Wright in Best Years of Her Lives was he gave her a very limited amount of money and said, you have to buy your costumes. You, you, you're buying your costumes. And they have to oh, look like real costumes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. And one of the dresses she wears in that movie is so memorable to me. I, I think it's a really great dress. So Which that's one? good on her. Um, I think it's one that she wears when she goes out on a, the double date with Dana Andrews and his wife. I think it has sign of some uh, detailing, like Grecian almost uh, detailing around the bodice. And uh, yeah, I, I like that one. That's so the one they take her. the picture of? I think so, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, and one thing, yeah, about her role in Best Years of Our Lives that I think she brings to a lot of her roles is she does have that sweet girl kind of image, but she also has this underlying tenacity of, you know, when she has to get something done, you know, she's someone you can, who's going to do it. And, you know, like the scene in Best Years of Our Lives where she decides, you know, she just tells her family, I'm going to break up that marriage yeah, because it's a is... bad marriage and uh, I'm going to, you know, I'm getting into this, you know? Can you imagine <laughs> telling your parents, I'm going to break up your friend's marriage? Like... I mean, it's it's crazy. It's audacious. But, yeah. uh, you know, when I'm watching it and I'm like, yeah, do it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, rewatching that movie again, not related to Teresa Wright, but I always forget the how much the um, airplane sequence at the end always kills me. Oh, when Dana Andrews is going through the kind of airplane graveyard. The and it, it, and I forgot about it, but the his parents reading um, his war accommodations going into it. It's oh just, my god! Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm gonna cry yeah. just thinking about it. <laughs> that movie gets me just about every time, and I've seen it a few times. I have it on DVD now, but um, you know, I can't not get uh, emotionally invested. Yeah. Um, so I, I haven't, so let's, let's maybe get back to Steel Trap, um, just to get through my page of notes. Uh, <laughs> well, the craziest thing is, have you, not to take away from right again, but are you familiar with Andrew L. Stone, the writer, director? So I did look into Mr. Stone's directing career. Uh, it was a very okay. interesting, uh, it was a roller coaster ride there. Uh, definitely yeah. a journey, a journeyman director. And it seemed like in this period, in the 50s, he was in kind of this groove of like suspense crime movies where several, uh, you know, kind of almost B picture crime movies. The craziest thing I noted looking into his IMDb is that whenever um, writer directors first started taking precedence in Hollywood, people always cited Preston Sturges and John Huston in the early 40s. And you look at his IMDb, he predates them writing and directing and producing these movies beforehand. And he had a pretty steady run making these movies going all the way into the 60s. Uh, He got... oh. The end of his career is wild because then in the 70s, he makes two epic musical flops that basically like help kill the big musical. <laughs> I, I didn't check. I didn't check into this. What, what? So in 1970, he made the Song of Norway. With, no, nothing. You, no. You, so you're not familiar with the uh, musical biopic of Grieg. <laughs> Norwegian no. uh, composer Edvard Grieg, no. uh, starring Florence Henderson, not as Grieg, but as <laughs> the main female. Mrs. Character. Brady. Wow. Yes, and this would have been when Brady Bunch was on TV. So, oh, man. Um, yeah. So the Song of Norway, and then the next one was called The Great Waltz in 1972, which was a remake of. A 1938 musical of the same name they just i guess were like let's try this again 
So that's where the band and Scorsese got their idea of being like, no more waltzes. We're doing the no last more, waltz. We're doing the last one. Let's, yeah, last, uh, let's quit this. We're cutting those off. <laughs> he Well, he had one um, screenwriting no, um, Oscar nomination in the middle of the yes. 50s. But, but there's something about the tone of when I was just looking at the synopses of these where it was somewhere between like Samuel Fuller and Ed Wood where he was like – get. <laughs> He was getting these yeah. movies made, and he was making them kind of down and dirty. And Steel Trap, Steel Trap kind of fits that. One of the coolest, most mm-hmm. notable things about Steel Trap is that there's only one set in the entire movie. The rest of it's all location shooting, and it shows. And it's not just like cheap B movie LA shooting. They shoot in in New Orleans too. Yes, and that's one of the things I love about it. Uh, I really enjoyed it this second time watching it. I was able to appreciate, like, hey, wait a minute. They're actually in New Orleans right now, <laughs> and it's uh it's cool to see like 1950s New Orleans. You you get to the point where they're in New Orleans and they have a stock shot of a plane landing, and you're like, oh, I we're gonna see an interior with a short ceiling, and <laughs> no, they walk out of a New Orleans or okay, they walk out <laughs> of an airport that has a stone building and says New Orleans Airport, but then but that's they go the real airport, but then they go to the quarter too. <laughs> And, like, yeah. they actually spend time – yeah, they go to some pretty memorable sites, too. Yeah, it, it was it was kind of a funny uh, thought when they, their plane lands, and then you see Joseph Cotton walking in the front door of the airport. <laughs> like, did they, did they let you out at the curb? <laughs> <laughs> um, I know specifically with the L.A. stuff, I was – I I also went back down the list of movies that is in the uh, – um, that great documentary Los Angeles plays itself. Yeah. It's not in there. And I was like, Oh, that, that's an omission. That's a, yeah. deli- that's a bad, cause yeah. this is a great early fifties downtown LA movie too. Yeah. And they have the scenes at uh, Joseph Cotton's bank, which is one of these like old, beautiful banks. There's this with crazy these scene with the, vault. the boss at the, be- um, it's like one of the second or third scenes in where he's got this elevated, office near the ceiling and the ceiling is gorgeous looking <laughs> i also loved the uh the vault room which i kind of have to has that great mirror the yeah, mirrored like the, wall so cool. they have <laughs> they have that one shot where they shoot straight into the mirror yes. to go, oh so cool yes yeah and and uh just to explain so from the doorway looking into the vault there's a safe where they're keeping the cash but the side where the lock is doesn't face the door it faces to a mirror that's on the back wall and so as joseph cotton is crouching there to open the cash box you can see him in full view reflected in the mirror but uh he can't really see if anyone's coming (laughs) it's yeah the um well because what's the other funny thing about the tension is that especially for like the first half hour it feels like they're going to bring this tension out of really one main location they go home Mm. but for the most part and like he he takes the train home but for the most Mm. part it just feels like the bank and then the movie kind of opens up a little they go to a hotel and then they get to the airport and and i mean it's still interiors but it's like especially for a movie that's shot on location like it it it, it was one of those used its b movie if it was b movie it's a fox movie right but if it used its b movie settings it's still using them for the best effect like it really it really uses that storytelling idea of you want to put your characters in the situation they least want to be in. And so yeah. like cotton keeps catching himself in a lie. And one of the most fascinating mm-hmm. things I found about his casting was that I don't think they cast him to play anxious, which is where I don't go for Joseph cotton, but like yeah. he's playing anxious or he's playing guilty or he's playing an inconsistently good liar. Cause sometimes like he lies so smoothly and then sometimes yeah. he's just like, what do you mean, money in my suitcase? <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing that's interesting about the casting, too, is that uh, Joseph Cotton and Teresa Wright had already starred together in Shadow of a Doubt Yeah, um, about a decade earlier. Did you played his niece. <laughs> did you, I, watching this, I made a point of pointing out what their age difference is just because that's a more modern trope of pointing out mm-hmm. a husband and wife, how old they are. Cotton at this point is 47 and Teresa Wright is 34. Yeah. But then you got to subtract um, nine years before them to go to yeah. Shadow of a Doubt. And 
but yeah. she was his niece so no 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 <laughs> no, no I, that's my point it's just yeah. you're just adding nine years to that and like oh marriage yeah exactly <laughs> like i guess 13 years isn't that big of a difference <laughs> in movies <laughs> well especially 40s movies there too <laughs> Are you a fan of the Fritz Lang movie, The Big Heat? You know, I haven't seen that movie. This reminds me a lot of, especially because this was, di or, um, 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 I, I saw it as classified as a noir, and there's a certain batch of 50s noir that really has to like go into d suburbia and domestic levels. Mm -hmm. Like I feel like the Coens have kind of milked a little bit of that in modern times, mm -hmm. that influence. And... Big Heat only really has it for like the first 20 minutes, half hour. But this also has that where it's just like post-war, these comfortable homes, these box houses are, are popping up. And there's this existential crisis of whether like we should be happy about this. And should I, should I love this domestication or should I rob yeah. my bank and steal a million dollars? Well, I mean, and that's kind of how it opens with Joseph Cotton kind of going through his daily routine and you get that. That's sort of what gives him not the idea, but he gets the idea like, hey, it would be easy to rob my bank. And maybe all of this day to day, you know, routine, that domestic, you know, routine that I'm in maybe I don't want that. And like, what if I did something like a, this midlife crisis almost of just yeah. like, what if I did, what if I just blew up my life? But he does want to take his wife and his daughter with him. Well, he thinks through that yeah, at least, not that, that he's going to leave them behind. Although and, there's the weirdness with the daughter, but yeah, that's a, right. that is a very valid point. I just, it's fascinating that that's where Phil Noor was at, where it was just like, we need to accept the nuclear family on top of this darkness <laughs> and shadow, too. Well, and I think to your point about it being a war, I think if it had a darker ending, that it would be unquestionably a noir movie. But I think the ending almost brings it. Do we out are we talking about that. the ending now? Well, so I'm I'm waiting for you're the host, so I'm waiting for you to say when we can give some spoilers here. There's so. oh. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we lost spoilers. We've kind of spoiled. Time, yeah. <laughs> I, I have a bunch of other things I want to go into in the movie, but the ending, yeah, no. like, you know, you, it's okay. The big point about the ending I felt was, I don't mean to be someone who watches a movie with when it was made in the back of my head, but I, the tension I had watching the movie was I was trying to figure out where is the brain code at right now? You know, the, and there's the clause in the brain code that says you, um, if someone commits a crime, they cannot get away with it. And I was like, it, where, where can, can you get away with it or not? Yeah, and you know, I was looking at, I was watching the runtime as it was going through um, to see kind of where, and it's funny how like it takes a long time. You see him go, through, you see him take the money. You see him. There's a lot of. Um, he goes through a lot of trouble trying to get their passports, and then they've got to get to the airport, and then they their flights delayed, and there's all kinds of like delays delays along the way and you're thinking are they even ever going to get out of los angeles and then are they ever going to get to brazil which is kind of their final his yeah. final you know goal and then it was like the last 20 minutes of the movie is when he decides to he stops trying to go to brazil or there's kind of like a stopping point where he gets caught by a customs person who questions the fact that his suitcase weighs 115 pounds which made me laugh throughout the movie <laughs> that he was running around carrying a 115 pound suitcase and they look in the suitcase and see all the cash and the, he basically gets confronted by a customs person about all the cash doesn't have a very good uh, you know explanation for it and then his wife finally knows the whole uh, deal we're going to get to how long it took <laughs> Teresa Wright to like actually stop frowning and say something and have a confrontation. But one, the thing, whenever they kept having these shots of, first off, there was, it was a, he had to check the flight. It, like it, there was like, it was like a, they went to Amarillo first, then they went to New Orleans, and then they were going to Brazil. So the he luggage had to check got his checked. Back. Yes, this 115 pound suitcase, and then they had the these, million dollars, <laughs> and they had these shots of it being dragged across 
uh, the airport, and all I kept thinking of is the end of the killing, the Kubrick movie, where uh-huh. like I just kept thinking that latch is gonna stick. That latch has to stick. It can't. It can't not like blow open and blow the money everywhere, <laughs> right? Right. That was a tension. Part of tension. Yeah, yeah, for really. sure. <laughs> and so yeah, so it's like twenty minutes to go, and he gets finally found out um, in several ways. Uh, he gets confronted. Although then... his his boss is his boss is just like I found him out. Let's play some cards. <laughs> yeah, that's a colleague from. Well, it's not his boss. His it's boss, a colleague his, yeah, at the sorry. bank, who goes over to his house where the um, mother in law is taking care of their daughter because they decided not to bring the daughter along, and uh, the daughter, of course, you know she's a little girl. She spills the beans that they're going to Brazil. And then the mother-in-law says, you know, oh, it's a bank business, isn't it? And that makes his <laughs> colleague suspicious because he's like, well, then I should be in charge of that. What? Blah, blah. He starts asking questions. And the mother the whole time is just like, well, it's bank business. I'm supposed to be able to talk about that. He works at the bank. You work at the bank, right? <laughs> yeah. Like, that was fine, right? <laughs> um, yeah. And then uh, he, so he goes home. But, you know, it's the 50s and it's this great thing of this is before cell phones. So he can't just call up the bank manager, yeah, the boss, true. who because of course he is. It's Sunday and he's out golfing. So. Which they they firmly <laughs> plant early on in the movie that yes, he's going golfing. Yes, they did plant that seed, and that was another tension point. You know, several times along the way. That's what was so great. Is first you get the scene where Joseph Cotton is waiting for his boss to leave, and he's talking on the phone about his golf game and he's just like checking his watch like this guy needs to get out of here so i can steal the money and then later they can't reach the boss to uh, verify any of the stories he's telling because he's playing golf (laughs) but yeah so then he finally gets find found out and then it's like basically his wife decides to go back to California. They're in New Orleans. The well, wife goes back. Let's talk about the confrontation scene. Okay. <laughs> the whole thing is like, I was watching this. I agree with you. There's a certain amount of, um, to, to use the 40s jargon, moxie to Teresa Wright's uh, general performances. But here, like, she goes a long time just like with some very troublesome signs and just going along with it until she finally... She overhears him give a fake name to a hotel clerk, and she's like, I have to say something. And the scene they have in there, again, I'm thinking post-war noir existentialism. And the quote he gives is something along like um, Cotton says when he finally says something to her, he's like, there's only so many days, so many hours, so many minutes, and we have to cram in all the happiness we can get away with. And, <laughs> and – I was flashed back a little bit on that really cool scene in Shadow of a Doubt where he starts cruelly talking about killing widows and mm-hmm. just how, like, you got to take what you can get when you can get it. And mm-hmm. it's not as well written of a scene as mm-hmm. the Shadow of a Doubt scene. It's a little clunky, but at the same time, he gets both these actors a little bit of room to do something. And r- this is where Wright comes out, basically. Yeah, and... And I, in that confrontation, one thing that one uh, thing I liked was um, she, you know, she's been with him on this journey. She didn't know what was really going on, and now she's had suspicions along the way. But now she knows he stole the money from the bank. He's admitted it, and it's he's trying to like you know explain his plan. We can live in Brazil, blah blah blah. And she's like, no, I'm not doing that. This is wrong. I'm leaving. I'm going back home. And he's like, how can you leave me? You know, how can you leave me like this? And she says, no, you're the one walking out because he chose to do this scheme. He's mm-hmm. the one leaving their family and choosing to go, you know, against the law. And uh, but he tries to, like, make it like she's abandoning him. And she's like, that's not what's happening here. Mm. Well, especially because, uh, like, yeah. he starts the film off saying, I've never lied to my wife. And then he just mm-hmm. lies to her for the next <laughs> hour and 20 minutes. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, I you think, you know, I'm married. And I think, like, I trust my husband. And if he told me that, you know, he was going somewhere for this trip, why would I – I wouldn't assume that he was actually robbing 
his business or something, you know, I wouldn't assume something crazy. I'd assume like, oh, this seems a little bit uh, different or unusual, but you even know, it, I'll go along with it. And, even but, it, you know. <laughs> he just starts snapping at stewardesses. Well, I mean, and she does talk to him. She's, I mean, along the way, she does, you know, she's basically having to react to her husband's increasingly frantic, panicked behavior and trying to rationalize it the whole time. Her role, I think, in the movie is that she has to be an obstacle because he has to, pl- you know, he has all these obstacles placed in his way. And she's one of them in that he's not, she's trying to go about her life in the way that they always have been. Like, for example, leaving the daughter at home. He wants mm-hmm. to bring the daughter okay. with them to make it kind of a clean escape. And she's like, no, no, she's little. She's never, I mean, they've never been on a plane. Like, let's leave her at home uh, this time. And his old justification is, we'll sin for her later. Yeah, and so then, and so, like, she, and she's just being a normal person, or, like, along the way when um, they can't get the passports in time or they miss a flight, she just says, well, can't we get the next flight? Can't, you know, I guess we'll just have to, you know, wait until Monday or something. And he, you know, in his, his plan, they have to get there this weekend. And so he has to come up with ways to, you know, kind of push aside any of her rationalizations of what, you know, normal people would do. <laughs> I won't I won't lie. There was one moment when she contradicted him on a plane. And I thought of that scene in Airplane where the wife is just like, Jim never drinks a second cup of coffee at home. Like that, <laughs> that was the level of like ineff- ineffectual yeah. nagging. Or internal nagging, but not saying anything, not directly addressing what was happening, that was happening until the until the hotel scene. Then the hotel yeah. scene, like it's all like she, she throws it down at the at the hotel scene. Yeah, and um, yeah. So one thing I did write down is that you know she has to kind of be in his way and reacting to his behavior, but I don't think she ever does it in a way that is annoying. Um, yeah, the way that I'll, I'll sometimes, give you that. I'll give you that. like in a movie like this. The, the, the shrill wife or woman. girlfriend, yeah, come, and I, I was trying to think of a good example. The, uh, what I could think of was uh, in Pulp Fiction, Butch's girlfriend, Bruce Willis's girlfriend, Fabian, uh-huh. who is supposed to like help him and is just like obviously not really holding up her end of yeah. things, like not doing things right. It is a common, forget- it is a common actress yeah. complaint that we're just given the shrill obstacle. We're, we're yeah. the, uh, we're, we're the um, obstacle to the man's um, dreams of freedom. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, he, he, and at least to its credit, he always wanted to bring the family along. It wasn't like me getting away from them. They were always part of it. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> She's like, no, uh, I don't think being, uh, you know, fugitives from the law is really where I want to take my life. Um, but the, I did say to her credit, uh, at the end, she does smooth things over with the bank colleague. Mm. <laughs> because... And she's very smooth when she did it. She was very smooth in that phone call. <laughs> um, so, you know, uh, I, yeah, I, knew, I don't know exactly what she said, but uh, she did kind of smooth things over with him. And uh, so then in the after she leaves to go back home, then you're left with wondering, well, is he going to keep going forward or is he going to go back and return the money? But he has to get the money there by Monday morning before the bank opens. And it's literally like the last three minutes of the movie is him like, you know, sweatily trying to get back into the bank and get the money in the vault. And then it has the (laughs) bookended um his day-to-day going home ritual yes yeah but yeah that ending is something that is like <laughs> i don't know if that's just like a moment in time that this that movie can, could get away with a movie uh, ending like that where like again i keep making the bring code jokes but it's like post that like let's put the genie back in the bottle really that's how the movie ends <laughs> yeah well i did your kind midlife of make a crisis note. is over yeah throughout the movie you know joseph cotton is trying to make people kind of bend to what he wants and uh, get away with things and i just wrote down like i'm a middle class white man do what i want (laughs) (laughs) um it's especially glaring Uh with the uh episode surrounding their passports because they need to get like yes 
like uh, extra, you know, quick passports. He needs to get them within a couple days and they have to pick them up at the office or get them stamped at the Brazilian consulate or something. Um, and, and he drags closed. out the Brazilian consulate operator out of on a Friday night, like, come back here right away. Yeah, blah, blah. I mean, he's dragging people out, you know, to open up the office because he couldn't get there before they closed. And then bef- finally, like, someone's actually trying to help him. There's like a like a uh, doorman or something yeah, yeah, at yeah. the there office. Was the elevator operator, yeah. Yeah, he's, you know, getting someone to come open the office, but he's so frantic, he can't wait. So he breaks the window, breaks into the office, steals his passports, and then is leaving when a guard shows up yeah. and is like, okay, I'm going to have to arrest you because you broke into this office. And he basically talks his way out of it. And then when an employee from the consulate shows up, and the uh, guard is like, well, do you want to do anything about this? And he's, he's like, eh, I guess it's yeah. okay. <laughs> and yeah. he just gives them like 50 bucks to fix the window and that, like runs away. That's the whole thing. Uh, leading up to the like t- uh, ticking clock of getting the passports in time, he just keeps dropping pe- money to people. He's just like, here's $50. If you want, you're want, you not willing to help me, well, here's $100. Which yeah. goes back to Teresa Wright's point of like, why are you spending this much money bribing? an elevator operator or like when they're in the cab on the way to the airport and they don't think they'll get there in time and he's like Mm. you know Mm -hmm. step on it here's an extra 30 bucks or Mm. something and she's you know just you can see on her face she's getting concerned uh but yeah like you said she's not saying anything but you can tell this is concerning behavior I want to give uh, Dimitri Tiomkin credit. He's there's a definite MVP of this movie. And the thing is, like, there's also a B movie feeling where like he's utilized a lot at the beginning to ratchet up the tension. Then he his the score disappears for a long period of time, and then it comes back in a little at the end. Yeah, um, I mean, you know, he's great. <laughs> yeah, um, Cotton. Uh, Cotton. I have trouble following Cotton a little outside of the stuff he's done in relation to Orson Welles. Um, before this, he did a Marilyn Monroe movie, Niagara, which I have never seen. And then he did after this, I don't know, straight after this, but Andrew L. Stone's next movie was another mm-hmm. crime movie that Cotton was in with that, too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think at this point in his career, he was uh, no longer, or, you know, a uh, top leading man. He was getting older, uh, you know, he was in late 40s, both... and his face definitely showed mm. age. Yeah, Espe- especially if you go back and look at Shadow of a Doubt. I mean, 10 years is going to do that to anybody's face, but yeah. both, both him and Wright were about to start going into TV after this. Yeah, and it was kind of a big boom in those sort of playhouse uh, TV shows where they would do little shortened versions of popular movies or mm. plays, and they both did a lot of those. Mm. Um, and, I mean, a lot of Hollywood people went into TV doing that um, just because it was almost like being um, in the theater, mm. getting to do different uh, great little pieces uh, and performing live a lot of the time. I did read a really cool quote where Wright said she learned a lot from TV acting for the live performances or acting in general, just being live mm. TV. Like, so it was actually a challenging thing for her and, and rewarding. But the thing with Teresa Wright though, I'm like, I don't know. I don't know if this is overall in the biography. It's just, she started out high and like, just, you know, went down from there (laughs) well you know i think she always preferred acting on the stage like movies wasn't you know her big goal she was someone that enjoyed acting and always wanted to be acting but she got the opportunity to be in movies and made some really great ones but she wasn't ever you know wedded to the idea of being a movie star and I think that shows in her career, she still kept making mo- I mean, she would appear, she appeared a lot of TV through the 50s, 60s, and in through the 80s, you know, guest appearances on things. And then she even made a few movies. She was, her last movie was The Rainmaker, the Francis Ford Coppola movie when, you know, she was um, quite elderly, but, <laughs> uh, you know, she still kept 
kept making movies. Back to going back to our Archers episode I did with Ted, I kept thinking Ted. about how um, uh, the the lead actress in Black Narcissus. Um, she was he, Ted pointed out she was used in Saving Private Ryan, and he pointed out that a lot of the movie brats would use a lot of their favorite actresses from the forties. In these roles where they're a grandmother, basically, but yeah. they would bring them back for these movies in the 90s and the aughts, too. Yeah, uh, that is something that you notice when you uh, look at, uh, you know, like, I don't know, Spielberg bringing in Audrey Hepburn, convincing Audrey Hepburn to be in uh, Always mm. or something like that. Um, another uh, another great place to see um, classic movie actors is actually Murder, She Wrote. Because, uh, you know, Angela Lansbury came mm. from, you know, MGM and mm. the classic era being in movies. And she brought in all her friends uh, to be uh, little guest spots in, you know, the murder of the week. And the, it's it's kind of awesome to see, you know, these faces you recognize from classic movies show the up. The crazier and... <laughs> uh, show I see keep popping up at the end of Great Actors IMDb's is The Love Boat. Well, yeah, then you had the love boat, too, because it was a rotating, you know, cast every week. <laughs> yeah. um, so did you, I guess, for any final thoughts about Teresa Wright, is there, I mean, we, we talked about the the big movies. We, we, we kind of left the gap after Best Years of Our Lives going into this movie, or at the very least to the end of her Samuel Goldwyn contract. Was there mm-hmm. any other movies you wanted to really... That of hers that you love that you wanted to mention um i'm not particular favorites coming you know in that period uh that first you know the 40s the first half of the 40s is really you know strong um she also made a movie called casanova brown with gary cooper in that period um, one of the a movie she made in 1950 that was actually a prestige movie is called the men and it was actually marlon brando's first movie i, I and, forgot to mention that yeah, and so she actually played the love interest, I believe, of Marlon Brando in that movie. And it's interesting that um, she was kind of known as being sort of that uh, very, you know, uh, unvarnished, uh, you know, unaffected kind of style of acting. And that's what, you know, Brando and the actor studio kind of right. people would bring in later is that almost the extreme of that. Well, one of the fascinating things when she quit Goldwyn was she made a point of saying, like, we don't need to be paid this much money to do these movies. So she was went from being this very high paid Goldwyn actor to taking very little money. And she was in the book. They talk a lot about her getting shortchanged on the men and getting they were originally going to yeah. do a favored nations where everyone got the same amount. And then she got cut off and then. Every movie she did after that point, she was saying that was the bracket of her of her quote was that point was that much lower. And I don't know, she was still doing the work. So there's that. But yeah, I did see a comment a quote from her basically saying, like, you know, I was thought I was standing up for, you know, the ideals or whatever. Um, but I just ended up say, basically telling everyone that I'd work for much cheaper <laughs> <laughs> and bringing down my, my quote. So kind of worked against her in that way. Uh, one of the last questions I want to ask you about uh, to end on a very <laughs> superficial and sexist question. <laughs> She's blonde in the movie. Teresa Wright's never yeah. blonde. Yeah, it's weird, huh? Yeah, uh, I, it is weird. Uh, you know, she's known as a brunette, and I think she, I think she looks better as a brunette. But uh, <laughs> seeing the blonde is a little odd. Well, it, it, it's weird because it gives her a sense of, um, uh, I don't know if I'm just thinking of Marilyn Monroe or what the type was at the time, but it was just like more of a common, the the Hollywood idea of an ingenue at the time. Because this movie also, the book mentions like. She w- this was her sexy role because she had a scene where she was in a bath towel. <laughs> I mean, I did notice that, like, uh, yeah, she comes out of the shower wrapped in a towel. You see the top of a shoulder. <laughs> <Whoa>. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, she was definitely not cast as, uh, you know, the, again, the sexy, glamorous one. But, uh, you know, I think I think that's fine. I think there's room for everybody. Uh, I wouldn't call this role her her sexy role. <laughs> Maybe just because it's a noir, or kind of noirish. 
they think there's got to be some kind of sexy dame she, hanging around. She has the least conflicted femme fatale I've seen ever. <laughs> right. Not, not fatale whatsoever. Yeah. Um, I, I just, I have this quote I wrote down because I read uh, Bosley Crowther's review in the New York Times of The Steel Trap, and I just thought this was a great quote. Um, it was a positive review, even though, you know, maybe Teresa Wright didn't think it was that good. But <laughs> the critic said, uh, it's an entertaining picture. The entertainment, however, being the sort enjoyed by the man who hit himself on the head with a hammer because it felt so good when he stopped. <laughs> it's like makes me really think about like why do we watch these suspenseful thrillers that kind of bring your heart rate up so much and is it because when it's over <laughs> you finally feel that relief <laughs> <laughs> wow um i think i think that's as good as a capper as we got yeah <laughs> all right I don't know. Check out the Steel Trap is what I would say. <laughs> yeah. Does it periodically appear on TCM? I, I yeah, occasionally. Um, definitely, if they're ever highlighting like uh, Joseph Cotton, it sometimes it shows up, and you know. Uh, but it is streaming for okay. a relatively cheap price. <laughs> okay. Well, um, uh, I guess that's enough for this episode, uh, Lonnie. I'm glad you were able to be on. You'll, unless um, an earthquake or some disaster happens, 2020, rep, you know, represent. Uh, you Don't should be on. Don't tempt fate. <laughs> Knock. Uh, you'll be on next week, too. So. Okay. Well, I look forward to finding out what we'll be talking about. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. Thanks for listening. Check in next week. Bye.